Hi, I'm Sam Cho from Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. We're going to be talking about spinal cord monitoring and spinal deformity surgery. Uh, we have two guests uh, this morning, and I'd like to have them introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Baron Lawner. I'm a professor of orthopedic surgery at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York as well. And I'm Hanjo Kim. I'm from the Hospital for Special Surgery. Okay, so let's talk about the setup. Uh, we can all agree that spinal cord monitoring is essential uh, in spinal deformity surgery. So what kind of setup do you have even before we talk about surgery? Right. So I think, Sam, you bring up a good point. Setup is, is the key. And I think in uh, our uh, discussions with patients and their families, I think uh, risk assessment is, is crucial and is part of the neurological safety. So assessing the patient's pathology, uh, the type of deformity that they have, for example, in a spinal deformity uh, surgery, whether they have a very angular, a rigid uh, a deformity a kyphosis, for example, that the risk of that operation, particularly with severe magnitude uh, uh, problems, is much greater than a flexible adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. So assessing risk by the nature of the pathology, the severity of the pathology, and then uh, the nature of the operation that is proposed. So a vertebral column resection for example, poses much greater risks than simply a posterior instrumented fusion for adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. And so part of that risk assessment is understanding the, the nature of the deformity, the magnitude of the deformity, the type of pathology, patient factors, and then finally additional imaging studies to assess the spinal canal. So MRI, myelogram as needed, CT scans to have a very good preoperative understanding of risk. All right. So, how do you want to have uh, set up? So, uh, for us, um, we utilize transcranial MEPs mm -hmm. and SSEPs and triggered and spontaneous EMGs. Now, um, I think um, a lot of places try to overlook anesthesia technique, but I think that's really important. Right. So, we don't use TIVA, actually. We, I think we use a technique that I think is even better than TIVA. Um, and we're gonna try to put some data together to sure. publish about that. But um, basically, um, it's go we still use propofol, but less of it. Mm -hmm. And um, we uh, try to use other agents, such as ketamine, which actually improves your signals. Sure. Um, and, uh, and also allows you to do a quicker wake-up test. <clears throat> and um, there's other things in the cocktail, including midazolam and fentanyl for induction. Very light on the gas. And if we want to control the pressure, we use Cleviprex um, or phenylephrine. So uh, I think these, uh, the anesthesia technique is critical because if you, sometimes TIVA, what can happen with TIVA is that, you know, the propofol buildup, right. when you get to like the fourth or fifth hour of the case for right. these big deformity operations, you could get a lot of false positives. Right. And uh, that could always slow, you know, everybody knows when you have lost signals, it slows the whole case down, right. you know. So... Um, so I think the anesthesia technique, as far as the, and that sort of setup, is very critical, very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you guys have any checklists? I think, uh, you know, borrowing from the aviation uh, industry, I think, uh, and there are multiple examples from other industries uh, with regard to the use of checklists safeguarding against potential complications, especially neurologic. So we, we do have a checklist. We have a formal checklist, but really it's a checklist that we have in our mind and it's part of our protocols in the hospital. Um, I think it's important that it, to assess the nature of the spinal cord monitoring or nerve root monitoring changes. If you have an isolated spontaneous EMG and you're replacing a screw and that disappears, it's probably simply a matter of some pressure on the uh, extremity during the uh, placement of the implant. As opposed, if you have a general attrition throughout the case of the SSCP and motor monitoring, that's likely to be more of this propofol buildup that Hanjo was speaking about mm -hmm. and perhaps uh, just systemic changes. However, if there's an isolated change, it's important to understand the nature of that. Uh, recently, we, had, we were doing a pedicle subtraction osteotomy and the patient had intact and uh, stable SSEP monitoring. EMGs uh, were fine. They weren't firing spontaneously, but we had a unilateral loss of the motor evoke potential, TIBANT uh, and EHL level. And so uh, 
we didn't quite understand the nature of that. So we thought about it as part of our checklist. What was the last maneuver we made? Uh, we had been uh, placing screws on that side in the thoracic spine, but it didn't add up, uh, especially with pristine SSEP. So first of all, you, you always check your leads. Uh, you check the core temperature of the patient, backtrack on the last step you made. And finally, our anesthesiologist checked the patient's uh, positioning. And sure enough, one of her legs had come off the pillow, and there was some compression on the perineal nerve from the, uh, the belt, the stabilizing belt. So in that particular case, we checked all of the things, uh, the positioning of the patient, uh, the temperature of the leads, uh, what was our last maneuver, and sure enough, it was a positioning problem in this particular case. Mm -hmm. And another thing that uh, can cause decrease in uh, signaling would be the uh, high blood pressure or low blood pressure. And the, you can have the anesthesia colleagues ask or ask them to raise up the blood pressure. And the uh, motor evoked potentials are particularly sensitive, as you, as you know, to uh, mean arterial pressure. So right. we certainly raise the pressure as well. Right. Good point. Anything to add? Like, what do you do when uh, the spinal cord sort of uh, do doesn't signal yeah. or there's a change? So, I mean, I think uh, for any sort of monitoring, uh, that's like a team communication, right? It's very important. So, not only between the anesthesiologist and the surgeon, but also with the monitoring team. So, um, I usually, throughout the steps of the case, tell the monitoring team to note the times for certain steps of the case. So, after exposure, I'll, I'll tell them, you know, we're done exposing. Then I'll say, we're going to start instrumenting. Mm -hmm. And then I'll say, we're done instrumenting on the right. Now we're going to start instrumenting the left. And then they note these time periods so that when there is a signal loss, then I could say, you know, how long ago did we do this? And then they sort of, sort of know. So if it's like a screw that we have to reposition right. or things like this. And then uh, the discussion with the anesthesiologist, if we lose signals, is uh, more along the lines of, you know, were, were there any inhalational agents given recently? Um, and uh, what's the hematocrit and what's the body temperature sure. for the patient and the blood pressure, of course. Right. Um, and uh, we, we do have a checklist at our institution where we go through these things. Um, but a lot of the times with deformity surgery, as you guys know, it's, uh, things don't always go exactly as, right. as you plan. So it's hard to follow a checklist um, to a certain extent just in, in an order. I mean, you end up checking off all the boxes, mm -hmm. but sometimes the order is different because, for example, in your case, Baron, if you, were, if you had closed down the PSO site and you saw a significant amount of buckling, you, you would eventually check all the positioning and everything like this, but the first thing you might do is say, you know, based on this, I'm just going right. to come off Release. on that, you know. Right. So, um, so I think uh, there's, there has to be a little bit of uh, versatility sure. and, and flexibility in, in, the, in the checklist approach, but... There, I think it is important to have one so that we make sure we, right. you know. I think the check checklist it. helps us facilitate communication. And from both of you, what I gather is teamwork is essential. Well, t teamwork is essential, uh, Sam. And also, I think it's important to have, literally have a surgical pause where everybody yes. on the team mm -hmm. uh, kind of stops. We speak. We talk about all these things that Hanjo was just mentioning.